and John the Baptist warned people in Judea to repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. What were they talking about when they said that? They were talking about Jesus, God's Messiah. He chose the king from the time of the Old Testament. It was prophesied that there would come a time when the Lord God himself would reign as king and rule over all the earth. And you see that prophecy in the passages like Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 10 and 52, verse 7. And when you have time, if you ever look at those passages, and you will see that God promises to come and rule the earth. And his rule is embodied in the person of Jesus. So yes, the kingdom of God is a person. But the kingdom of God is also a place. Several Old Testament passages show God's kingly rule acted out on earth and in heaven. For example, in Psalm 103, verse 9, the Lord says, I mean, the, the prophet says, The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. In Matthew 28, verse 18, when Jesus begins the words of the Great Commission, what does he say? He says that all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. This is evidence. That his kingly rule over his kingly rule is over all of heaven and all of earth. So basically, to merge the two and to put it into one statement, the kingdom of God is where wherever God's king is and where he rules supreme. Did you get that? The kingdom of God is wherever God's king is and where he rules supreme. One of the greatest passages that show Christ's supremacy above all is Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 to 18. <laughs> Let me read it for us. It says, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn, firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and, and, and invisible, with the thrones of powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in whom all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the first one among the dead. So that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And through him to reconcile all things to himself. With the things on earth for things in heaven. By making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Can you see from the passage that I just read that the kingdom of God is centered around God's king, which is Christ? See, going back to my opening story about the World Cup winning victory and the trophy, you can picture Christ as the trophy. Wherever Christ is, they celebrate. Wherever Christ is, that's where the kingdom is. Without Christ, there is no kingdom, there is no victory. We celebrate and rejoice in God's kingdom because we celebrate and we rejoice in Christ. We love the kingdom because we love Christ. The kingdom of God is not only Christ, but it is where Christ reigns and where he reigns supreme. But there is one other element that needs to double tap on. And it's that the kingdom of God is a realm or is a place in which only the saved or the redeemed of Christ apart. It is only those who have been told to get to celebrate the champions. It is only in terms of those who have been saved by his blood. In Colossians 1, verse 13, Paul writes, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and has brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. Who did Christ rescue from the kingdom of darkness? Well, it is those who were once dead in sin. It is those who are once moved by the flesh and those who are once dead without hope. We can come for it from every single one of us in this room. These are the people who are part of God's kingdom. Friends, the kingdom of God is his kingship, his rule, and his authority. And what a great joy it would be to be a part of it. But what do they take to be a part of it, you might ask? You might have heard it said, what does it take to become a spring ball for me? I mean, uh, a World Cup winning ball. What does it take to be part of God's kingdom? There is a story recorded in three of the four Gospels about a rich young man 
Some of you might have heard the story, some of you might be hearing the story for the first time. It's about a rich young man who desperately wants to be out of God's kingdom. That any one of us might have wanted to, or would like to be. The man seems to have his story figured out when he came to Jesus. He was prepared to answer every question that Jesus was ready to ask him. He was very much sure that nothing would stand in the way of him entering the kingdom of God. As he approached Jesus, he came, he claimed having kept all the commandments of the Lord from birth, from youth, actually. There was not one way he had broken in his view. At this point, you might think, oh, this man is quite impressive, right? Eh? He didn't break even one law. Jesus then said one thing to him that made him realize that he was disqualified to enter into the kingdom of God. And he was that he couldn't give up his riches for the sake of the kingdom. He just couldn't let go of it. And as a result, according to Mark, he walked away solitary. He just couldn't give up what he had treasured. He broke the very first commandment to not him know it. He just couldn't forsake it for the sake of the kingdom. But the truth in the story isn't really that. It is not the money alone that has qualified this man from entering the kingdom of God. It is the question he asked in the very beginning. When he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? See, that's where he got it wrong. He thought that there was something he could do. Just after this, Jesus said to the disciples, he said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Why did he say that? Why would Jesus say that? He said it because he saw the rich of even of themselves. But it is because in this specific man's case, the rich is where he placed his trust. To another person, it is how can a successful man into the kingdom of man, I mean the kingdom of God? To another person, it would be how can such an ambitious man enter the kingdom of God? How hard it is for a man like that to split their trust in whatever it is to enter the kingdom of God. We enter into the kingdom by the virtue of what Christ has done for us and that alone. If you think that there's anything you can do or anything that you have that has made you enter the kingdom of God, and then by virtue of that you'll be disqualified from entering the kingdom of God. We enter on the basis of what Christ has done for us. A couple of verses later, it turns to the disciples who were even more amazed and they said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With men, it is impossible. This is impossible. Not, but not with God. All things are possible with God. It is only the person who recognizes that true wealth is in the cross who can enter the kingdom of, the kingdom of God. The ones who have given their own to God, those who have understood that they are nothing with God, without God, they are nothing without God. And all that we are and all that we can ever be rests in the power of the cross. Friends, this is not only how we get into the kingdom of God, but it's also how we are transformed. Now, <laughs> this understanding allows us to be transformed by it. Which leads me to my second point. How does the kingdom of God radically transform us? I will use one story to show how the kingdom of God turns our world upside down, completely. There comes a point in the Gospel of John where Jesus was worried about his usual business, his usual business of preaching and proclaiming the Gospel and giving every disease and affliction that he comes across in his individual. So this individual, we don't know much about him other than that he was born blind and that the reason that he was born blind is that the works of God might be made, made, might be made known to him, might be displayed in him. And we know that he's not born blind because of any sin, no, no, no any, any sin that he performed, nor any of his family members performed. Jesus then goes ahead to this man who was born blind. <coughs> and he knew him by applying mud on his eyes that he used by forming mud. The way he formed this mud was to spit from his mouth in the soil that was close by to him. 
Thanks to the fact that they tried to die, and it also was meant to go wash his face in the pool of civil rain, which just basically means sand. The pool that doesn't mean sand. So this man walks in me, he cleanses his, his eyes of this pool, raises his eyes, uh, and this pool then comes back being able to see. So this is the first part of the story. So the second part of the story is that this is a very strange way of healing a person. And very different from how Jesus usually heals people in the world. But what's interesting about this specific miracle, as recorded by John, John's Gospel, is that it only happens in the first seven verses of this chapter. The remaining 30, 34 verses is the aftermath of the miracle. The miracle of the book is profound for at least two reasons. The first thing I'm told is that the fulfillment of an Old Testament uh, prophecy found in Isaiah 2 verse 7 about the coming Messiah of God's kingdom and the kind of change he's going to bring. So there's a whole moment of that. But the second thing, or well, the second reason why it's so profound is because there has never been a miracle that this ever before Jesus' time. Never. The man himself even said it in verse 52 of John chapter 9. He said himself, no one has ever heard of a man being born blind, being able to see. One author said, no ancient trade dealer or modern art surgery can compare with the clarity and fullness of the physical restoration Jesus brings. Jesus healed this man's sight. He restored him. He restored to him his sight as if he was never blind. But even more profound, friends, is the message that Jesus has in store for the people who are watching on this miracle as it unfolds. From verse 13 to 34 of John chapter 9, the Pharisees begin to investigate this miracle. But why is it such a big deal to them? Why do they investigate? Well, they are upset because this miracle was performed in the Sabbath. And because it was done on the Sabbath, they don't want to believe that this man could be of God because he breaks the very law of God. And so that's their reason. But even though this is their reason, they cannot believe that this miracle has been done. It makes no sense that, that Jesus could perform such a miracle. So in their disbelief, what do they do? They call the man's parents. They bring, him, they, they, they bring this man's parents to trial. And they find out if indeed this man was born blind. The parents affirm that yes, indeed this is our son, and that the son of ours was born blind. But how he can see and who did it to him, he did not know. And so, they dismiss the man's spirit. For the third time, they bring the man. They call the man to stand. And they tell him, give glory to God by telling the truth. By this point, you must understand that truth to them is denying what Jesus has done for But that's something he cannot do. Because it's too, it's, 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 it's obvious what he has done for he, he cannot deny what Christ has done for him. He cannot lie to what Christ has done for him. So he tells them that Jesus is the reason why he can see. And indeed, I was once blind. At this point, the irony of the story is that the only blind man can see that Jesus is a prophet. But he doesn't see Jesus for he truly is at this point. It's as if one eye can see Christ. I mean, the prophet, or can see what the Christ has done, but the other eye is so blind to who he is. <laughs> he's confident that he is healed, and that he's born from God. And he knows that if only if God was with a man, could a man do such a thing. But he doesn't have a full picture of who Christ is. The investigation ends with the Pharisees concluding that the only blind man is a sinner and one of Jesus' followers. And so what do they do? They take him and they cast him out of the city. Now the character of the story isn't all of that. And so I'm about to read the last six verses. We put a couple of those verses will be displayed on the on the screen. From verse 35 it said, Jesus said that they had thrown him out. And he, when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is it, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have not seen him, and in fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, 
Before I know it, boom, I hit the wall. At the, at the moment I looked for it, boom, I hit the wall. I had a huge scar, gigantic. And then I thought it was a drowning. Yeah, eventually I was dead. But it was a See, the point of me changing the story, not that you feel sorry for me, that I was gone. <laughs> the point is that because I never saw where I was going, I could never be saved from what was ahead that's exactly what's happening here. Though I could see, I couldn't see properly. I was looking at the wrong direction. And so many of us, maybe that's how we're living our lives. We think we can see, but actually, we don't know what danger lies ahead of us. Christ comes, He graciously comes and says, I'm going to give you sight to see. The kingdom of God, for what, and the kingdom of God for what it truly is. To give you eyes to see him who he truly is. In conclusion, the kingdom of God does not require us to think that we can see. The kingdom of God requires us to admit that we are blind and that we need, we are in need of him, of vision. God will graciously give us sight, and we have to admit that we are blind. The more blind we are, the more sight will give us to see his forgiveness and his love. The more sight will give us to experience his transforming power. Friends, we walk by faith, not by sight. So let us repent. Let's repent. For the kingdom of God is at hand, as Jesus said. Allow me to pray for us. Our Father, we. We repent of the time when we thought that we could see, when we thought we could see you clearly, when we thought that we understood what you are all about, and we abandoned that, Father. We leave that at the door and we come to you with nothing, admitting that we are nothing and that you are everything. May you give us grace, Father, to see you, who you truly are, I will admit that we are so blind, Father. We cannot see what is here by the of us. And God, we open our eyes to see your great forgiveness and your great salvation that you have won for us. Oh God, we thank you for all that you are. Thank you for being our vision. Thank you for being our wealth. Thank you for being everything. God, help us each day to abandon our boast, the boast in ourselves or whatever boast we have in ourselves. To abandon that and to keep going back to admitting that we are blind without you.